Okay, one more person in the waiting room and we'll just get started. So welcome everybody to our event focused all on the pitch. And we're so fortunate to have um, Joanne Fido Fideko with us today. Joanne's actually an alum from the GR Shaw School of Business um, based out of California, San Francisco now, but for right now she's in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Joanne is the CEO and, um, and founder of Connections Silicon Valley, an organization that helps Canadian companies collaborate, connect, innovate, and partner with Silicon Valley's world-renowned technology ecosystem via programs, events, and customized advisory. So um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend too much time. I I want I want us all the time to be out, Joanne. So I'm gonna hand it over to you right now. I'm gonna put my mic on mute and I. And um, afterwards, we'll unmute and have questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Cecile. Really great to be here, guys. Like Cecile said, um, physically in the Edmonton area right now. So I'm enjoying the weather pattern with you guys here at my parents' place in St. Albert. Uh, I'll plan to speak for about 30 minutes. And if I go over that, I'll wrap it up quick. Uh, as I was saying to Cecile before we started, I feel like we're, we haven't quite gotten zoomed out. Everyone's still connecting into the zooms and doing webinars and whatnot, but I don't really want to be the talking head and I'd much rather we have some uh, wholesome conversation. So there's a few topics that I can chat with you about. Um, so I'll give you a bit of a flavor of me so that at the end of this and the time that we have together, feel free to ask in anything that you might have of me. Uh, so I grew up Northern Alberta uh, on a farm and very proud of my Alberta roots. I studied at Nate, like Cecile said. I ended up going on and getting my CMA designation in the early 90s and started to work for, you know, the traditional kind of companies that we all have here in Alberta. ATB is the first one, PCA, worked at Deloitte. And then in 1999, I ended up moving down to Silicon Valley. So I just marked my 21st anniversary of living in the Bay Area and uh, my fourth time voting in a U.S. election because I got my citizenship fourth time, third time, third time, I think, voting. Uh, so in 1999, the world changed for me, um, but I didn't quite know it yet because uh, I moved to the Valley and I really thought everything uh, changed overnight because um, I was living in the dot com uh, era. I worked for a telecom startup uh, very early on after after leaving Deloitte. And, and after that, I actually found my very first passion in life, um, which was in the nonprofit sector in the Bay Area. And I, for a little while before taking another stab at a startup, um, and I always say, which I could say I worked for Google, Apple, or Facebook, but those weren't the startups. Um, the telecom companies still exist today. The aviation startup does not. I learned a lot of lessons working in those companies, but also just like the ethos of which, you know, I've lived in in Silicon Valley. Um, I found my second passion when in 2014, I had the opportunity to run this organization called the C100, uh, which is based in the Bay Area full of expat Canadians that was started in 2010 to support Canadian entrepreneurs accessing Silicon Valley through their network of either serial successful entrepreneurs, um, investors or executives. And um, it was really instrumental in helping kind of open up the borders and showing to U.S. investors the opportunity to invest in Canadian companies. And I had the pleasure of running that from 2014 to 16. And that's when I realized that the world didn't look like Silicon Valley. When I started to come back to Canada, um, I realized that the, the world that I lived in, like, sort of woke up with a sense of urgency. We um, we're early adopters of everything. Um, you know, the bar was really high and it kept getting higher all the time. And just like the, the pace, um, the pace to which that we were operating and the amount of opportunities that were coming to Silicon Valley is just, you know, very unique to anywhere else on the planet. Um, and then in 2016, I became my own boss and have found my last passion um, or current passion, which is just being my own boss and running my own organization, which is Connection Silicon Valley. And we do a number of things, and this highlights a few of them to give you a sense in case there's any questions that want to touch on some of these things afterwards. So my main business is to helping to connect Canadian companies into Silicon Valley. We large, largely have worked with startups. It has largely been philanthropy. 
um, helping startups just get a lay of the land, understanding how the Valley operates, the mindset uh, from Silicon Valley. We used to do that with in-person events. Um, uh, lots of introductions that I've received over the years. Um, we've worked on the Canadian corporate side as well, introducing uh, innovation executives that are looking to, as I always say, see where the puck is going, coming to a place like Silicon Valley and looking at where technology is headed and where it might fit within their industry. Uh, a couple of years ago, had the pleasure of uh, securing a contract with the Alberta government and myself and a partner of mine based in Calgary, we manage the trade and investment between Alberta and Silicon Valley. And in government speak, trade means I help support startups, access the Valley or export out of Alberta. And Christy, my business partner, does the investment attraction. So trying to get companies to move into the region of Alberta. And thankfully, we've been successful on both sides of the market. But because nobody really knows where Alberta is and Alberta doesn't have a brand, um, uh, connection Silicon Valley, we came up with this concept earlier this year to, to launch a grassroots marketing campaign to attract global companies in that would ultimately expand their operations in Alberta. So this is just something that Connection Silicon Valley has launched uh, in order to try to build the Alberta's brand um, in Silicon Valley as well as, as globally, because other regions are way more well known, as you can imagine, of Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver and Waterloo than in a place like Silicon Valley. A few years back in 2017, I got a bunch of women together, mostly expat Canadian women that I knew in the Bay Area uh, to uh, support women, Canadian women led companies um, accessing again our resources and network in Silicon Valley. So we've done physical events in the Valley before and now we're launching a membership based program for any female led Canadian company uh, globally, actually any Canadian company globally that wants to access the network and that is coming out uh, anytime soon. Uh, and then the last thing is a few years back as well, myself and some expat Canadians, you're starting to see a theme, um, got together and are created a nonprofit in the life science space to help support the Canadian entrepreneurs within life sciences, again, access the network in the Valley. So we've got some leadership team members from both sides of the border. Um, one Deloitte partner in life sciences from Edmonton, a partner out of a uh, venture capital fund, in Montreal, some folks out of Toronto, as well as a few of us in the Valley, we've got about 400 members in that program, in that entity, and we've, we're running a program right now for entrepreneurs in life sciences. It's a cohort program with nine companies from across Canada. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, for today, uh, the conversation is all around the art of the pitch. And uh, I'm going to take this from the perspective of Silicon Valley, because that's what I know the most for the last 21 years. And so it doesn't always equate and fairly often to maybe an investor mindset in Alberta or even Canada or maybe elsewhere in the world. Not saying that it's right or wrong. It's just saying the perspective that I have and the experiences that I bring to you. So that's the lens for which I am speaking to you today. Before we get into actual pitching, I'm going to base an assumption that if or if you're going to be pitching, you have an idea um, and you've done something with that idea. And usually this is kind of the um, high level model of what that looks like, right? You've come up with some really great idea, uh, something that you've seen, a gap that's missing, an experience that you've had, and you've created an MVP, a minimal viable product. And once you have that MVP, you know, again, Silicon Valley Speed and the rest of the world have, a, have adopted this sort of lean stack mindset and um, iteration model is, you know, you're gonna quickly go out and validate that. And test it in the market to your set of users or potential customers. You're gonna get feedback. You're gonna be building those customers and those users, hopefully, um, based on the feedback. And then you're gonna keep iterating on this. And you continue to iterate and build on that idea and that product and solution and the target market that you're going after, um, ultimately throughout your you know, business until you sell. So we're starting with the fact like you have an idea and you've got something that investors you think should care about. So the big question, and the first one is, why do investors care? Can you see my full screen? I'm going the wrong way. Um, uh, quotations from the poems. Oh, I'm not sure if I can quite do anything about this right here, but it seems to maybe have cut up. So apologies there. I will fill in the blanks if anything is missing on here and we'll be able to share this presentation. So the reason why investors care 
is because um, if it's a really, 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 really big idea, um, they care about it. If it's something that has global reach um, and can has the opportunity to make them a billion dollar exit, it's kind of the bar in Silicon Valley. Um, if it makes them money, and this is the most important thing, investors really, their guiding light, their North Star is if it's gonna make them money. And it's not if it's gonna make them a little bit of money, Again, from this perspective of the majority of venture capital in the Valley, they're looking to make kind of 20 times their investment. And we're going to dive into like why they're looking for that as we go through this. But the number one thing that they care about and are looking for is, is this can make them money. And mostly if it's going to make them money, it's a really, really big idea with a big differentiator and it has a global reach. So I want to spend a little time just on venture economics. Um, a venture capital fund needs to return, in general, targeting three times the return of their fund in order to reach what they'll call this venture rate of return. So if a fund um, has been able to secure $100 million from LPs, limited partners, banks or governments or um, pension funds, um, those are the assets that classes that are coming together to put in money towards this hundred million dollar fund a venture fund is looking to 3x that in order to get a venture rate of return so out of all the investments that they're going to put money into they want to make 300 million um, in return so we're going to just walk through a scenario going um if we have a hundred million dollar fund and we've invested equally into 10 startups and we have our guiding light to return a 3x on that fund um, what does it look like in order for that fund to get the venture economics out of it? And what, therefore, do you need to think about as a startup as you're pitching to these venture funds? Again, keeping in mind their number one goal and their only goal is to really make money. So um, 10 companies invested $10 each, and we're assuming in this case um, that the VC has a 25% ownership in each one of those startups equally. Obviously, this is just an example. This comes from a TechCrunch article from a few years back, but I think it's pretty, pretty relevant. So the first scenario is that all 10 companies exit at $50 million each. So the graph shows that, um, that uh, the $50 million return and in purple, the $13 million, essentially 12 and a half, they'll get as their return from that. So each one of them equally distributed. Um, the VC fund takes 12.5 million for their 25%. They end up with $125 million. They needed 300 million, so it's not so good. They haven't achieved their expected rate of return. So we give a little bit of extra in here. Five of the companies we say sell for 50 million, but five sell for 100 million. So founders are overnight millionaires. Their pictures in the paper, they're pretty excited. How about the VCs? Well, we do the math on. Five of them, again, get that 12 and a half million return. The other five get double that at 25 million. We're at 187 million return. Still not anywhere near the 300 million that the VC fund needs to get to. So we go to work a little bit more. So there's an accelerator we put in here. Again, let's say five at 50 million, four at 100 million, and we get one at 500 million. And as you can imagine, for a startup, for yourself, for a founder, for a founding team, for a company that has, you know, the employees have equity, some of these numbers are, are pretty darn big, right? We're, we're pretty happy with that if we're on the startup side of things, if we have a $50 million exit, number mine a $500 million exit. Um, as you can tell, as we look at this as an example, we're still not there at the $300 million return that a venture fund needs, even with some of these amazing economics that a founder, founding team, and employees at a firm can receive from this. In Silicon Valley, we often call these as lifestyle businesses, which is sad, kind of. Um, but basically, these are companies that might make a hell of a great return, might provide really great economics, good economic drivers, um, build jobs, make people happy, but have a significant, meaningful impact in the world with their product or service, but still not actually reach the target goal for a venture fund, which is to make money and make that 3x times return. So we would have to get to Something more like this. We need one large exit in order to see the really good profits. And that's that unicorn, right? That billion dollar exit. So if we do that and we say nine startups do reasonably well, okay, like lifestyle business, $50 million each, and one of them goes for the $1 billion, and that $1 billion returns $250 million, we have now made it to be able to return that fund and 
a little bit more of a total return of three hundred sixty million dollars. So when people talk about the billion dollar unicorn exit, this is kind of the scenario they're looking for. Venture capital are looking for one company or they're hoping for one company that will return their entire fund to them. This one doesn't quite make it because it's 250 million. Well, it does make it. It returns the fund of 100 million. It doesn't achieve their goal. But they're looking for that one company that returns the whole fund because until they actually return that $100 million that fund, they make zero money. So they don't make any money until they actually return that $100 million. So that's their first target. And then they want to get to actual venture um, profit. So more realistically is something like this. And probably this is too over realistic, right? Because we know that most startups fail. 80%, 90% of startups um, actually fail and don't make any money. So in this case, we've got five that make zero, three that make a small X $25 million, um, one that makes an exit at 200 million, a fairly you know decent size return. And again, that one superstar at the billion dollars, um, which gives them the 250 million. And then again, we're achieving the venture economics that a fund is looking for over $300 million. This is a lot of work. And you can imagine when venture are going into this, every company that they're seeing and venture um, capitalists in, this, in the Valley usually see about a thousand decks a year and probably more now that COVID is hit. So they're seeing these decks within three to five minutes max, they're making an assessment of whether or not they think that this company can return their fund and can really be that billion dollar global you know, business that has the ability to, to return their fund and get to their venture economics. The reality is that for most VC funds that return this three X time, is about 5% of the funds out there. So that means 95% of the venture capital funds are either making a little bit of more money than they wanted to, or are actually losing money on their fund. So there's um, this, not, not sure what these funds are doing. They all look like and act like they're being super successful out there, but these this is a reality for, for venture. And I quote at the bottom of this, the TechCrunch article that I pulled this data from, and if Cecile will send this around, you'll have access to that as well. So again, going back to why do funders care? Well, they really, really care, again, if you're gonna return that money to them and if you've got that opportunity. So it really needs to be a big opportunity with that global reach, the billion dollar exit. And it needs to, they're looking at that to every opportunity to say, can this return at least 20, 10 to 20 times my investment? Because otherwise it's not worth it for them and, and for their money, for their limited money that they have. So now I'm probably depressed all of you <laughs> on that side. Um, why should investors believe you? So they will believe if you display confidence. So the number one thing that I think that is so important is to be able to show to the investor that you know your stuff, that you believe in your business, that you know the data, that you have a very good handle on the market, um, you understand the audience that you're going for, all of the unit economics associated with your business, um, and that you're displaying that you know high level of confidence. And there's a thin line sometimes between high level of confidence and ego, right? Because nobody really wants you to walk in and just be like, we're gonna crush this and no problem, we've got this. Um, and we'll get to the reasons why other than the obvious. Um, Canada does really well on this side in some ways because um, usually Canadians are less egotistical than Americans um, tend to be. Uh, so they like that, but often Canadians will show up and be too conservative. They won't actually um, put a, a mark out there as to what they are think they can achieve um, or what they really want to achieve. They put out what they really believe that they will. They actually state the numbers that they they, they forecast is, is going to actually do. Um, so you need to be just a little bit more than that. It's You need to kind of stretch yourself. We call it also swinging for the fences. Um, so it's not just about what you think you can achieve, but what could you achieve if you really push yourself, if the team really pushed themselves, if you really wanted to be that global business and be the, the, the world dominator in your market? So you need to think a little bit bigger and still display that confidence with that. Um, you need to bring some experience. And I say it's earned or borrowed. And the earned would be, 
A lot of times, if you've worked at Google, Apple, or Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube, um, any one of these fast growing Silicon Valley companies, um, or global companies that they are uh, have a highly recognizable name for, then you, you get listened to a lot faster then obviously somebody walking in off the street that doesn't have any street cred or worked for any one of these brands before. Um, now, likely a lot of you won't have that experiences, but if you're looking for starting a business in the future, then the idea is to go wet your feet and get some experience working at one of these bigger players um, or getting lucky and finding the startup that does do a really nice hockey stick trajectory and you can be with them along the path of their growth. Um, because being a founder isn't always about being a founder right out of the gate. Um, in a lot of cases, you'll do better off if you go and work for some startups and gain that experience um, on the way before you ever go and try your own foot at being a startup yourself um, without that experience. You can also borrow some of your experiences um, by bringing on some advisors. Um, in this case, you also want to have some brand names on there. So we see a lot of times Canadians will put some advisors that are local. Um, or maybe known to them, maybe have experiences, but they're not a brand name or have any significance or relevance to a Silicon Valley investor that's looking at that. So it might help you in your business as they might know the product or the market or have some customers, but on a pitch deck, those names are kind of meaningless. So think about that. It's um, uh, maybe behooves you to look at somebody in the US, maybe more close to the area that you're gonna be pitching to um, like Silicon Valley to find somebody from there that might have a brand name or some other credibility that could lead um, and help you when you're when you're pitching. And data obviously is 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 very important to be able to have that to be able to prove what it is that you're selling out there. I'm keeping my eye on time, so I'm going to just make sure I keep going. Um, so why should investors in join you? Um, so again, going back to that confidence and ego piece, the thing that um, investors are really looking at is if you're coachable. Um, meaning that if something happens, because it will, along the way, the product doesn't quite turn out the way you expect the results, the um, customers don't sign up as quickly as you want, things cost more money, um, maybe market shifts, maybe something like COVID hits. Like how are you as a founder and a founding team and executive team going to be reacting to that and leading your company. And that might mean that you need to pivot and you might need to pivot away from that idea and the original concept that you have. And most likely your, your product will shift a lot from the very first time you had the idea to what it ends up at the final days. And so the investors are with you for seven to 10 years in all likelihood is the average. It's like a marriage, right? We've heard that before. We know how marriages end. Um, so founders, investors really want to know that when something blindsides you or, you know, the investors or the market or whatnot, that you're going to be flexible enough to be able to adapt and you're not going to be stubborn in your ways and be so stuck on something um, that you won't be able to pivot for the best of the business. Because again, these guys are interested in making money. They don't care about what your original idea was. If that doesn't fly anymore or it's not gaining the traction, they're investing in you. So the second point in here, the number one thing that investors always invest in is, is the founder. Above all anything else, they will put that as number one. Do they believe that founder? Do they think that the founder has the ability to go the long distance? Do they think that they're coachable? Um, if that idea doesn't work, will they pivot? Can they do something else with them, again, with their money that they've already invested in? So they're believing in you over the product all the time. Um, again, we'll come up. That's most important for them. If they don't think it's going to make them money, nothing else happens on here. Um, your product needs to be defensible. So it can't be one of the me too's out there. It can't be something that's just a little bit better. It can't maybe just serving a different geography. Again, your goal should be a world global dominator, whatever you're doing to get Silicon Valley to pay attention to you. Um, but they need to see that there's something in there that is defensible enough that they feel again for when they go out to market with your, your product goes out to market and their money, that it's going to be able to stand up against what exists today or what Google, Apple and Facebook book could probably make within a way shorter period of time with the resources that they have. So whether that's um, IP and patented information, um, you could be first to market advantage mover on it. Again, it could be a really great team of AI machine learning experts on that. Um, and they've got some really, really deep expertise in something. 
um, something that has to be defensible in your product. And they need to feel like they can add significant value to you. Sometimes investors pass because while they might think you're great, your product is great, there's a big gap in the market, they feel that they could see it. If it's not their space, and if they don't feel that they can add value by their experience, by their network, by their dollars, then they're not. They're, that's not going to be the thesis that they're going after. So they're going to be on this journey with you again, seven to 10 years. They want to make sure, and they will be part of that journey with you, sometimes too much part of that journey with you. Sometimes you really crave them to be a part of that journey. Other times you might be, get out of my way. <laughs> I've got this, but they're going to be there with you. Once you get on this in um, VC treadmill, um, you don't get off of it. Once you start taking in venture capital, most likely you got to keep taking in venture capital. So you're with these guys and more um, investors throughout that seven to 10 year journey. So a couple as you think about um, presenting and pitching to investors, um, I always say, do it. I say not what I do, like take my advice, I'm not using it. Um, invest in a good designer. This is not a good designer deck, um, but it is very important. Uh, you don't have to spend a ton of money on this, especially that everybody's accessible, uh, you know, remotely and whatnot, but it you need to show up well. And you show up well when you have a really nice um, laid out deck. Uh, you've got the, the highlights points in it, but you also have put some thought into having that deck look good and flow nicely. So uh, it sounds kind of silly, but it's uh, so it, it is an important piece. It doesn't need to cost you a lot of money that will um, build a lot of credibility to you if you put some thought into the design of it. Um, before you go and pitch to who you want to actually pitch to, the ideal investor, you need to go get feedback from some people that won't invest in you. So these can be experienced founders that have gone through investing before, maybe they're people within your space, but not maybe directly competitive. Maybe it's investors who are investing in a couple stage later than what your stage is that you're pitching at at that point. Um, anybody that has asked some battle scars or have been there, done that, <clears throat> and spent time in front of investors getting that real hard critical feedback, people that have gone to 100 investors because that's what they say is the average before you get money, to pitch to 100 investors, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> you want to get them so that you have all the critical feedback up front. You know that because you've now can incorporate it into, into your deck, you will have that in the margins or within the appendix. You'll have an answer to it in case they ask it for you. But you want people to really be critical and point out all the missing gaps, show them where there's, show you where there's the holes, see what people are thinking about get them to give you that unabridged version of critical feedback so that you can take that um, so that when you're ready to pitch to those ideal investors that you can nail it. Um, do your homework, <clears throat> make sure that you're pitching investors that are investing in your stage and your space um, at the dollar check size that you're looking for and critically make sure that they don't have a competitive investment um, so that they can look at your deck for you. And you as a founder need to do that homework not me who you're gonna ask to make a warm introduction for you, but you, and that is a lot of work. And I wish there was some great tools out there, but there's not. It's a lot of Google searching, a lot of you know asking people and just your own research in order to figure out who those ideal investors are to target. You need to know your market, your data, and your numbers. You can't go into any kind of a presentation and look to your CFO guy or your numbers guy or your product guy to have the answer to things. You as the founder need to understand all of that. And you need to be able to pitch and present it and know who's your competitor, who your competitors are, how much money they've raised, where your product sits in comparison to everybody else that's out there in the market. You need to know exactly where you fit and your numbers, and again, your go-to-market strategy, and all of those things that are positioning yourselves to be that global leader. And just note that you're going to always be iterating. You're going to start with the deck where you're going to go, that's it, nailed it. And then you're going to do it 100 more times. And each time, you hopefully will feel like you're going to nail it. But this is an ongoing iteration um, that you're going to like update based on feedback, based on you know product design, based on market conditions and things that happen out there. So go into it knowing that this is a long game. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's going to take you um, a long while, most likely, to get to your end goal. So pace yourself. 
and um, celebrate the small wins rather than being worried about the, the places that you don't hit. Um, there's no place like Silicon Valley, um, I think, um, you know, so think about it as a place where you want to pitch to. If you're building a nice hundred or $2 million business, that's not for Silicon Valley. That's again, a lifestyle business. Um, and there's probably not investors that will look too much to you, um, from a place like Silicon Valley. But if you're building a billion dollar global, um, leader, then come to Silicon Valley. Um, so I'd love to hear from you if you have an idea. Um, I'm happy to give you some early quick feedback on that. And in the future, um, I'm not sure who's all in the audience as to like when you might or if you will ever be pitching to investors. But if you do, um, a really good way to be able to go into markets is go through people that you know. Uh, investors will say that they'll take that warm introduction, you know, over um, you know, obviously a cold one. The best way to get to investors is for a portfolio company CEO that they've invested in to recommend you. That it comes at really high regard. Um, if somebody else uh, that they've invested in believes in you, um, if another investor that they believe um, and have credibility with invested in you and they come and say, hey, I've invested in them, I think you should too. Um, and then the third would be um, a warm introduction, somebody like myself that they know and you know respect and can trust, and we'll take that warm introduction. Um, and expat Canadians are a good place to start, alumni from Nate and other networks like that that you have. And with, I will stop sharing and open for questions. And I'll ask you to put your video on so I can see you since you've had the pleasure of seeing this for 30 minutes. It's only fair that I get to see you. <laughs> So you can put your, your question, if you're not comfortable, you can put your questions in the chat. Um, otherwise, it would be great, a great opportunity. She's, Joanne shared her LinkedIn. You can't connect with her if you haven't shown your face and talked to her. So um, show your face and, and, and ask questions. Hi, uh, Joanne. Is there a standard format for a pitch deck? Yes, I think so. Guy Kiyosaki is one that we recommend. He has a 12, um, a 12 page pitch deck um, and it outlines exactly the 12, the 10, 10, 10, 10 page pitch deck, if I said 12. Um, it has exact things that you should be putting on each one of those 10 slides. The most important thing is to remember that when you're pitching, you're not trying to boil the ocean, far from it. You're trying to get the next meeting. So your pitch deck, especially in the beginning, should just be really hitting the highlights on what's the big problem that you're trying to solve? How are you solving it? What's your unique differentiator? What are your financials? What's your go to market? You know, what's your ask in it? So I can share that out as well through Cecile, but it's Guy Kiyosaki's 10 slide pitch deck. I've just, I've just put it in the uh, chat. It's Excellent. in the chat, everybody. Yeah. Be, we don't want to see something that shows up with 20, 30 pages in it. That is the first thing that everybody looks at when they open up a pitch deck is how many pages. <laughs> so you want to be in the 10, 12, maybe 14 slide range. Just really think about what's that one point that you want to be, that you want from that one slide. And it's really hard to not try to say everything. But it's so important that you just put enough in there because um, all you want is a meeting, right? You want them to say yes. You want them in their three to five minutes to say, this looks interesting. I'll take a 30 minute call. Thanks, Dale. What else? Who's got a business idea? Who's started something? Who wants to start something? Who's raised money before? Hi, Joanne. Andrew here. Hi. I'm, I'm curious what you tell founders uh, who, who are trying to measure the, the social impact of their business or idea. So are they a social impact startup then? Or are they just it, trying for to... sure. 
So I'll speak on like for, you know, social impact businesses is gaining a lot of traction and interest out there. So there's social specific social impact investors. And there's also businesses now, of course, as we're um, entering or in our world that we are today with um, the racial injustices that have happened with the Me Too movement, with all of the, you know, situation happening, um, just like in our economics and environment today, that, you know, in in addition to doing um, building a business out there, they they also do like to see that you're um, you know being good at it and and doing that. So I think for those um, that are have a more social impact uh, uh, thesis and an approach that, that that's kind of very clear. It becomes a little less clear for somebody that has just a marketing SaaS automation tool um, pitching somewhere if they've got some you know social impact to it. I'd say then are probably using that less as a yardstick um, nice to have with it again they don't want to see ego or anybody being an asshole and if you're doing good great um, but i'd say it's more relevant uh, with those companies that are actually addressing some of those um you know social economics um out there thanks thanks mm -hmm. thanks for the question all right who else i'm gonna call names <laughs> <laughs> And I can see names. Even if you don't have your camera on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ryan. Gary, Gary, Gary has Ryan. a question. Gary has a question. Well, yeah, um, I, I wouldn't say I had a question exactly, but you did mention it, if anybody's building anything or, or are they working on something. And uh, I figured I can interact with you and, and uh, get some feedback. So, yeah, uh, so basically I, I'm working on an early startup. Uh, we're pre-seed, we're looking to build some traction and we're building a hardware product. Um, so, and, and long story short, what we're building is a disinfecting delivery receptacle so that people can receive their packages at home safely. And so what we are encountering is that um, it's it's a lot of capital to raise up to to help with the product development. So that's one of the reasons why this meeting uh, was very impor important for me to to come to because we're looking to raise a good amount of capital. So, um, do you have any suggestions when it comes to hardware? Is I think my biggest question. Um, and does that take a specific approach? Because I know that SaaS is appealing to a lot of investors because it's a much easier model than hardware. Yeah. And a lot of what I spoke to is kind of looking at more of a SaaS based business versus um, a medical device or, a, you know, a hardware clean tech um, where there's yeah. a lot of capital yeah. into it. Now, the good part for you is that you're very narrow, right? Um, in what you're trying to achieve and therefore your investor set is going to be a lot narrower and they'll know your business um, in it. It's not sort of nebulous for it. Um, hardware is um harder <laughs> in that case um for it because you do need that capital investment but if you find those investors that are you know hardware investors and they exist and there's accelerators out there for you to you know uh reach out to and whatnot um then of course you're just going to be talking to your you know your target audience there the one thing that i'd say is if our building this um, at all because of COVID in the disinfectant and trying to bring that just really, you need to really think about life after COVID because this can't be a solution that is just for COVID because people won't invest in that. Um, it really needs to be something that will stay on the field and have a, a life and a relevancy beyond there. But there's some, there's, of course, in the Bay Area, uh, Bay Area has a flavor of, of all of them um mm -hmm. out there so mm -hmm. i would just get with your tribe as soon as you can and really start to like surround yourself by those folks and really understand what the economics are or what the metrics are that, that you need to be thinking about as you're building okay yeah no i really appreciate that that answer and insight um you do bring up a, a really wonderful point because our product is not specifically um meant only for the lifetime of covid we understand that covid is a thing that is here now and will come and go hopefully. And um, we we do have uh, our, our main thing that we're tackling is porch theft. So I think that's something that we've all also have struggled with uh, in our pitch is how do we communicate that, you know, um, porch theft is the, our main problem that we're looking to solve. 
but we are keeping in mind the current um, environment. So what I find often is I'll receive a deck from somebody and when they walk me through it and they say um, the relevant points that they want to get across on that slide, it is actually very different than what they've put on that slide. So I always say talk through it because you're probably trying to overcomplicate things or put in different words or put a lot of like numbers or things on something to communicate when it really can be maybe much simpler on that. So if you're saying that's hard to communicate, then just say what it is, um, mm -hmm. you know, there instead of trying to, again, mask it and kind of make it sound with a bunch of words or um, thinking something would be hitting the investor. I see that all the time. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Yeah. Do you have an actual MVP of it? A prototype? Uh, yeah, we do have a, a prototype. Um, it's it's still a bit early, but we're looking to launch like a phase one um, within this month. Great. Well, feel yeah. free to send it my way. Awesome. Thank you. There was a question by Calvin. What about proprietary protection and sharing ideas? Ooh, this is such a good one. Um, most likely, you do not have anything that proprietary out there. <laughs> if you do, don't put it in the pitch deck. Um, um, a lot of times, we'll see Canadian companies that will put uh, like put an, want an NDA or put like even the initial page of um, confidentiality on it. And really, Silicon Valley investors will never sign an NDA. Um, until they're looking to do due diligence with you and like getting in, into it, wanting to like see underneath the hood a lot more. Um, so again, if you've got something super proprietary, just keep it out of the deck otherwise and keep your deck open. Um, an investor, if they look at it, that's why you really need to make sure that an investor or anyone that you're approaching doesn't have a competitive investment. They will tell you right off the bat, like, hey, I can't look at this. We've got something competitive um, in it. Um, but you are exposing yourself if you have done your due diligence in that regard on it. So just really make sure you do your homework. Who else? Nate's paying me by the hour, guys. <laughs> any advice for individuals that hardly have any experience putting out, putting out a venture and needs to learn the basics of economics? How do you create universal uniform body for groceries and in the future of other products in the form of bulking, which gets rid of packaging and places the product in a smart dispenser in a store that can have a subscription service related to online shopping. Have you built a team for this? Who asked this? Cassidy. Um, okay, there's a lot in there. So first of all, for anybody that hasn't built a business before, I mean, there's so much that you don't know. So start to surround yourself with people that have been there and done that um, there's so much available to you there's everything from the blogs out there you know y combinator of course is a big one tech stars brad feld um one of the things that i highly recommend is you go and invest in some reading on the opposite side so brad feld's venture economics or um, jason calacanis's angel books that you can have on audio um, are awesome because they're going to talk to you about what the investor side is looking for from an angel to the venture economics piece of it and it is um, super important for you guys to know that as you're going out, if you're going to go down that venture path or fundraising path at all. Um, you know, accelerators are great. Um, some of them are, are way better than others. And um, there's a lot that aren't that great out there. Um, and they, some of them do really take a, a, vent, a percentage from you equity. Um, so you have to really look at some of those. Uh, but try to find, again, places where you can be other founders um join groups um whether that's facebook or you know other things where you're just kind of learning to read getting connected to people um follow people on social media that are in your space or have been there done that before um try to connect with them a, a lot of people will connect with you if you go out to them with a specific ask you don't want to say hey joanne um i'd like to like take 30 minutes and pick your brain it's kind of like the kiss of death you're like hey joanne i see that you've invested in these other companies um, I'm trying to build something that's kind of squarely in that space. And since you've uh, helped X company go from Y to Z, then I would really love 30 minutes of your time to share what we're working on and to be able to see maybe what mistakes that I can avoid. Um, so, you know, do, do that and probably eight, nine out of 10, you'll get a response back from the person. 
Um, but please never, ever, ever reach out and just ask somebody to pick their brain uh, on something unless you have a specific ask of them and think really about why, why they might be interested in you. Again, are they investing in you? Do they have expertise in that? Are they talking about that subject? Are they a thought leader on it? Have they built a company before in that space and would get a kick out of what you're doing? Um, always think about it from the other person's side. And then there's a whole bunch in there as well as to how you build the business. Um, but first, I think you got to get the fundamentals on just starting the business. <laughs> then you can figure out some and, and surround yourself. Go find some ad early advisors. Um, Founders Institute has a really good advisory, uh, 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 I guess, sort of model out there uh, to be able to give to equity to advisors. It's anywhere from like a quarter of 1% to maybe 1%, depending upon their level of engagement with you. Um, those are, that's a really good and inexpensive way early on to get some, to hire and borrow some talent into your business. Um, but again, be really critical of those people. It should be like almost like an interview process itself. You shouldn't just, oh, I saw Joanne speak. She knows a bunch of people. I'm gonna like ask her to be an advisor. Really make sure that that person can add value. Um, think about that brand name recognition as well. Do they have credibility that will help us in the business um, as we're going for funding? And do they have a, the network and the contacts that I need, whether that's funding or customers or markets? What else? I see Gloria and Jennifer and John and Omara, Neil, something, anything. Ryan, did you want to ask your question? Yeah, I do have a question. Uh, first of all, thanks for your presentation. And um, what I heard, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but number one, they're looking for a return. And then the second thing, they're investing in you. Sure, the product is important, but they're really investing in you. So a key thing is to, to demonstrate that you are legitimate, that you are capable and competent. And one of the things that you used was having advisors that you could refer to and say, hey, these, this group of you know, well-known people are advising me, which gives me more credibility. What else have you seen to, uh, for entrepreneurs really to demonstrate that they're credible and actually worth investing in? Besides relying on other people to give that credibility. That makes right. sense. One thing could be their experience like in the market. So if they're, you know, worked in oil and gas for 15 years or in healthcare or in retail and they've seen the problem firsthand, that's a really good indication. Like they really know that problem statement and therefore are working at, at solving it. So that's um, one way to do it. Um, additional team members, again, if you can have some people that have that deep experience um, that's building the product for you, um, that's also can be really, really helpful. Um, just really knowing that market, again, if you don't come from that market at all and you're saying, hey, I want to build like a fintech payment, but I've been, you know, in healthcare all my life. It's like you got to really prove like why you're going to be the person they bet on to build a fintech payment product out there. Um, and that's like harder to do, not impossible to do, but it might be this ton of research that you've done. Again, knowing that market cold, knowing the competitors out there, knowing exactly the problem that you're solving and how you're going to solve for it, you know, can get you there. And investors and traction, nothing beats traction. You know, if you're like you, the thing with companies, right, is sometimes always they put the revenue last or they're market traction last things. And that's the things that will get any investor's attention. If you're like, hey, we've got half a million dollars in revenue. Okay, that's meaningful. Where's that coming from, right? We've got, we're working with Lego and BMW and, you know, Airbnb as customers. Okay, that's going to get you some attention. So always think about how are you building meaningful traction um, and showing that people are betting on you and, you know, again, to, to build or for investment. That makes sense. Thanks for the question, Ryan. All right, anybody else? This is it. Hi, Joanne. Oh, go ahead. I was, oh, hi, Dale. <laughs> I was curious, when you're uh, at the team building phase and you're 
making a decision between who would make a great advisor, um, sort of an unpaid advisor team member, and who would make, you know, a, be better in a director role. Um, I'm just curious what, what kind of things to look for. Well, they're obviously two very different roles. Um, you know, somebody that's coming into your business, especially, I'm assuming this is early on, I mean, they need to live, breathe, you know, eat, sleep your business and, and really believe in what you're doing. Um, you know, culture and, you know, team compatibility are super critical, especially for those early employees. Um, never mind if you're trying to bring on co-founders with it. So you just really want to make sure that you're in line with them. And if you've got somebody that, you know, again, eats, breathes, sleeps, what it is that you're doing, knows it, is excited about it, um, is committing their social capital, um, time, their time capital to it, um, and even willing to waiver, you know, give up some money capital, right? Because they're not going to get a lot of money out of it. Um, then you've got some very good indicators of somebody that can really probably help you in your business. Um, for an advisor, you know, you don't want somebody necessarily that's too much in your business. You want them to be able to be out there saying, okay, we're having a really hard product with pricing, problem with pricing right now. We not, we're not really sure how to price this. We need some expertise that's gonna help us that can figure out some pricing models for us or help us figure out our go-to-market strategy or has all those connections in the industrial automotive space for us because those are our customers. Um, so think about that very differently of uh, those people that can help bring you expertise or networks. I would say they should sit on the advisor side, whereas those that can really know and love your product and want to build it with you, you know, you want them on your team. Dale, did you have a question? Yeah, if there's any students who want to jump in here, then by all means. Uh, but my question real quick, Joanne, is uh, a lot of early stage entrepreneurs are concerned about people stealing their idea. And so they're hesitant to share it. I was just wondering what your thoughts were around that. Yeah, again, to what I said before, I mean, most likely they're not developing something that is completely unique out there. Um, I would, there's a lot of times where I'll get hear from founders that'll say, yep, we're completely unique. Nobody else out there is doing anything like us. And then we put them in front of a Silicon Valley investor and they've seen three of those already in the last week, right? Somebody was funded by $10 million six months ago. Um, so it's imperative that the founders actually really look outside of their walls of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and really get a, an understanding of what's happened in the landscape and really having an honest conversation with themselves. Are they doing something that unique and that differentiated out there? Um, you know, they're not gonna grow unless they share what it is that they're working on. So certainly there's people that are like in stealth mode in the beginning because they're feeling like they have a competitive advantage. Um, uh, a lot of times those are experienced founders um, that know how to do it and just need to be like heads down and not have any distractions, build something and be able to come out strong. If you are a first time founder uh, and you're really trying to build something, I think you want a little bit more exposure than less in order to get the input and influence in there. But again, whatever you put out there on a deck, nobody's going to be like, well, let me go do that. Like the chances of that are extremely, extremely low. So I would say just be open um to feedback but again don't put your secret sauce in code on the pitch deck yeah well thank you guys all for having me today <laughs> thank you joanne really appreciate you sharing your time i know you're very busy and uh and and the fact that you share your time with us and our students is is so valuable. So thank you again, everybody. I'll be sending out a short survey, so please take a moment to fill it out afterwards. And also, I wanted to just mention to our students: don't forget our pitch competitions coming up. That's why we did this session. Are you thinking about what's important in a pitch? Um, and we're giving away eight thousand dollars this month, so you don't have nothing to, nothing to sneeze at. If you have questions about that, you can reach out to me. Next week, we have Arden C. in from Yale Town talk about um, venture capital and the funding landscape. And uh, this week, we also have League of Innovators and Cultivating the Entrepreneurial Mindset. So, um, as always, have a wonderful day. And thank you again, Joanne. Thank you.
My pleasure. Thanks. Bye. Good luck, everybody. Thank you.